This is a Pace production. Let's put our hands together for this man. Good evening, everybody. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Um, I guess we're getting started. Um, my name is JB Yoshimoto. I'm a visual artist. Uh, pa uh, I'm a painter by trade. I was born in Japan uh, uh, to Chinese parents. I was raised mostly in California. And so I uh, say that because you will see that it has some influence the way I create my work and, and, and my processes and how that's influenced the way I make my work today. Um, so I'm just going to get started here. Um, I have my master's in art therapy from the School of Arts in Chicago and my MFA in, from, in painting at Syracuse University. Um, in my undergraduate studies, I was at the University of California, Santa Barbara, and I got to walk along the beach or the roads to get to my studio so on campus. So I thought I was in a pretty good place. And I was uh, making things like this, uh, painting on found objects that's usually discarded. I would uh, uh, upcycle broken uh, objects and then try to uh, create visual imagery and stories and to kind of retell a story that, of what it might have been in the past. Um, but when I was finished with my studies, I th thought I knew a lot about art. But one conversation with a friend of mine uh, told me that I didn't know enough, or I didn't, basically didn't know anything about art. And what he told me in that line was, art making is an egocentric act. And I asked what that is and what that meant. And he said that, oh, art making is selfish. It's self-serving. And so from that point on, I was kind of determined to try to figure out, is there a way to make art that's more than just being egocentric and self-serving? So uh, for my grad, st grad school, I went to Chicago to study art therapy, as I mentioned. And in my first semester, my uh, mother that was estranged from for 14 years had passed away from cancer. And so that put me in a very bad place. And I was, in, I was depressed for a long time. And I needed to create something that would bring me out of the funk. And I, one morning, I was in Michigan at this artist residency uh, called Oxbow. And they were serving breakfast. On this random Wednesday morning, I saw this piece of bacon that was incredibly beautiful. I'm like, oh my god, I got to bring this back to my studio. I got to paint it. And so that's exactly what I did. I, I th thought this bacon brought me joy. So I got a little obsessed about making large bacon paintings over and over again in my studio. So I started making bacon that's like three feet long, five feet long, then made some sculptural pieces about bacon uh, that's more uh, minimal um, conceptual. I uh, turned an old California map I had into bacon. Uh, then I would make a large 17 foot bacon I would drape across my uh, co-worker's uh, lunch table. Uh, this act of creating something joyful was something I needed at the time because I was suffering so much. And I think that brought me out of a funk. But at the same time, I realized at the end of the series that I was kind of walking in place. I wasn't really moving forward with the way I was making my work. Uh, so I needed to dig a little bit deeper. So I went back to Japan as a kid, uh, I'm sorry, uh, for the first time since I was a kid, which has been about over 20 years, to kind of try to re rediscover who I was as an artist, who I was as a person culturally. Uh, and I was observing things like uh, street food, street foods and um, religious uh, artifacts, uh, pop culture items, and how that influenced the way I looked at the world. So I made these tiny two inch by three inch uh, paintings uh, on tiny little campuses using watercolor. And I was making tiny smart aleck remark that's very sarcastic of me. And uh, it's my way of observing my, once my home culture from an outsider's perspective. It's ironic that my home land was now foreign to me. Then I didn't know where I belonged in the long run. And after that words, I came back to Chicago uh, to finish my art therapy practices, my art therapy studies, and I started working with different populations from uh, the elderly, the people with various mental illnesses, and the youth group, and uh, uh, finished up my art therapy degree. I worked as an art therapist for about a year after my graduation, but after a while I realized that I wasn't doing enough creatively, so I decided to go back to grad school at Syracuse University where I started this uh, thing called the Godzilla Invade in the US series. And I made these series because when I was a kid, I remember Godzilla you know, on uh, movie reruns on TV. And it's this ridiculous man in a rubber suit just doing crazy wrestling moves. And as I kept watching, I, re I was realizing that Godzilla's just hungry, just trying to get some food to eat at the local nuclear facility. And um, wherever he went, he was getting picked on, whether he be it uh, uh, humans or other monsters. So I imagine Godzilla to be the loneliest person in the world. 
And thinking that in mind, I thought I could relate to that feeling of feeling so isolated and being away from everybody and not feeling like I have a home that I belong in. Anyway, I was looking at other artists to kind of see what kind of cultural influences and what kind of aesthetic influences I can pull from. So I was looking at traditional and Japanese woodblock prints, looking at contemporary artists like Masami Teraoka, who made the McDonald's Invading um, Japan series. Um, a lot of contemporary artists like uh, Banksy, uh, but historical artists like Francisco Goya, who made contemporary paintings at, at his time about the things that he was witnessing around the world. Uh, that said, I started trying to combine different elements, different aesthetics uh, to create the Godzilla series, which you can see upstairs in the show. Um, and some of them were very tongue in cheek, some were more observations of the world. Initially, it was very introspective, it was about my personal narrative. But the more and more I paid in the Godzilla series, the more it became about my observations of how I fit into the world and uh, my surroundings. And this was from 2010, uh, the BP oil spill in the Gulf uh, that I felt really uh, taken aback by. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> and then I made a piece that's more tongue in cheek. Because since I am a Chinese, I was also influenced by some um, political uh, graphic uh, posters. Um, and I wanted to create a piece that's about consumerism because I love shopping. I love Black Fridays, the sales are fantastic. So very much tongue in cheek, but you know, I, I thought I could make this glorious poster about my love for shopping and how much joy that brings me. So it's this piece, um, it depicts all kinds of different stores, like um, Best Buy, Target, Walmart, uh, thrift stores, Chinese restaurants, any, any way that I love spending money on is, the, is how it's depicted here as like a, a joyful party. And at the top it says, I adhere to the ideology of consumerism. Uh, so again, very tongue in cheek. This uh, original illustration was uh, uh, about 10 feet high by 20 feet wide, but since I couldn't print it that big, it, it's a little expensive, uh, I basically made it like a, about half a size. And then I started thinking about the possibilities of digital drawing, what that could um, be converted to, transferred onto. And so I spray painted a black uh, a board um, uh, and did like a negative laser engraving to bring out the light to kind of pay homage to the woodblock prints that I was being inspired by. Um, and then I started thinking, well, what else can I do? Uh, well, can I start something from an analog drawing and turn it to digital? So this is the ink drawing. Um, and that I turned into a colored uh, digital drawing on, in Photoshop. And then I started making a chocolate mold. This is a peanut butter and chocolate candy bar that I melted and molded and laser engraved and eventually broke apart to share with my friends as like a shared experience. So the idea of transforming an artwork from a plain drawing to something more was uh, something I was trying to explore at the time. Um, before I could finish the series, uh, an earthquake uh, struck in Japan on March 11, 2011 where a 9.0 magnitude earthquake uh, struck the northeastern Japan and it triggered a tsunami that wiped out a number of cities including Sendai, which was hardly on the biggest uh, hit. Um, about 200,000 people lost their homes, 20,000 went missing. And so being so emotionally impacted, I decided to make a large painting to be a memorial of such a tragic event, which came out to be this 30 foot scroll painting, which you can also see upstairs. Um, I was at uh, an artist residency in New York um, at, the, at the time. It's called Art Students League of New York. And I started out on the far right of the painting. Uh, this is about maybe seven or eight feet long. And I thought it wouldn't be any more than 10 feet long at max. But the director of this artist residency walked in uh, as I was working on this. And he said, you, look, you got a 30 foot long piece of painting. Why don't you just paint the whole thing? So I basically said, OK, challenge accepted. So I kept going, uh, so I, and I collected as many images as I could of the, uh, of the earthquake, of the tragedy, of the rescue, and um, I just rolled it up uh, in the tube, and in the back of my van, I threw in a bunch of different uh, doors and uh, sawhorse tables to be more like my portable studio as I went. So I traveled with this thing from New York to Vermont, and to uh, Chicago, to Nebraska, back and forth uh, for a period of about a year to complete this painting. Um, so it took about, a little bit less than a year, about 328 days. Um, and these are some of the details. The nine rings um, represents the 9.0 magnitude earthquake. Um, the whirlpool is where all the houses and uh, boats and cars got, uh, got sucked into at the, to the bottom of the ocean. Uh, the ship there is the USS Abraham Lincoln, which is the first on site to provide assistance. Um, and back there in the chrysanthemum, uh, which is a national flower of Japan, 
Uh, you could see the nuclear facility, uh, uh, Deitch plant um, exploding in the background, releasing the radiation into the water and into the skies. Uh, the infrastructure of the roads and the houses collapsing. Um, uh, this, I felt, was like a key image for me because I saw an image of a mother losing her child and it was very emotionally impactful. So that, I feel, was the anchor point. And then I depicted scenes of rescue um, and uh, volunteers coming in to help rebuild for the future. Um, so after I was done completing this painting, I went to a, the local blueprint company to help me scan this, which took about 20 tries or three hours later, but we were able to successfully scan them. And I printed about 100 of these and to be sold at my solo exhibition in New York City in Manhattan. And every single penny that we got from this show, uh, we donated to a nonprofit in Japan, and which helped fund uh, like an art uh, workshop with kids who were survivors of the earthquake. The kids initially was only drawing black and white circles, um, on the paper, but eventually as they worked and worked and came back for more art classes, they started to smile again. They started to draw in colors. They started to connect, communicate, and they were healing through the process of art making over time. So that I felt was very rewarding. So eventually I decided to visit Ground Zero in uh, Sendai where the tsunami hit, and all I saw were foundations of houses for as far as eyes can see. Uh, most of the survivors escaped to this local elementary school and stood on the rooftop to watch their homes and lives get washed away to the bottom of the ocean. And there were so many debris, you know, rust debris that's uh, as high as about three, feet, uh, three stories high and with no places for these rusted objects to go. This is about 10 miles inland where the water still damaged uh, tremendously um, and it was very devastating for me to observed this scene because I was so awestruck, I felt small, and I felt hopeless, and I broke down uh, and cried for a long time. Um, when I came back, I decided to work on a series of disaster paintings. Um, first based on a smaller version of the, of the scroll that's more com uh, easier to hang and show uh, around the country. And then I did a series of other paintings, such as uh, this one, where I imagine where all the different debris from Japan washing up in the Pacific Northwest. So in this particular image, there's a motorcycle that washed up near Portland. Uh, there's a ship that washed up uh, near Vancouver. Um, and a soccer ball that also washed up near Vancouver that was actually kind of interesting because they had the owner, the kid's uh, name and address on them. So the Vancouver couple who found the soccer ball was able to give it back to the original owner. So it was like a little bit of full circle story. Um, and then I started working a series that was a little bit more, more different, uh, more domestic. This was about uh, um, uh, Hurricane Sandy uh, and up in New York City and Jersey, uh, how it damaged the infrastructure there. And then I started doing stuff overseas, where um, back in Syria in, I think, 2014, when the U.S. was considering a strike against the Syrian uh, government um, because of the biological uh, uh, weapons that was used against the citizens. Um, and then I started making commentary pieces about how there's a lot of trash in the ocean and how that's affecting uh, our uh, lives, um, and the sea lives as well. Um, and other different narratives around the world where this is uh, the Malaysia Freight uh, MH310, I think, that went missing. Uh, and you know, its families uh, waiting for an answer that they never got. Um, to make the other commentaries such as uh, the Faroe Islands where uh, Waiting once a year uh, to trap them into the bay to, uh, for mass slaughtering. It's more like an annual tradition, kind of like our 4th of July, and how brutal that is. So my shift in interest was shifting, but at the same time, there was a problem with the way I was doing research in my work. And uh, that was the fact that I was relying on other people's stories, other people's images to create my composition. So in 2015, I got a research grant from Joe Mitchell Foundation, and they asked, what would you do with this money? And I said, I'd like to go overseas. I'd like to collect my own stories. I'd like to take my own pictures. So the first place I went was Nepal. Uh, and in 2015, um, I heard that they had a massive earthquake that struck the entire country. And all the infrastructure was broken. And people were buried uh, alive. And people had to be rescued. Uh, but it, also, it was also during the monsoon season. So people couldn't really go back inside uh, because there were so many aftershocks. So it was affecting the way people live so, so much. Um, the story that really um, got to me was the village of Langtang. This is by the Annapurna Mountains. And it was a village of about 300 people. Um, and this was before the earthquake hit. And this was after the earthquake hit. 
this bill is just arrived by one person, uh, one man who went shopping for his wife. Uh, he had about $7 worth of money and never saw the whole village again afterwards. So the kind of story that I heard really struck me. And th these are more of my uh, images now. Um, and I went to look at what had happened. This is back this is in 2016, and I was just exploring different parts of Nepal and how there's still so many things that were left broken and the families, the homeowners have to pretty much pick up their own homes brick by brick to build their house back together. Um, I went up into the mountains where there were no roads uh, that you kind of have to hike up there and people are living in these uh, debris basically. And so I was talking to uh, different people and they said that there's been a nonprofit that's been coming in and was trying to teach the local villagers how to make more temporary shelters that's, uh, that's a little bit more stable. And eventually they came up with this design where it can actually sway sideways without actually collapsing. So uh, through that process, the, the villagers were able to use their own materials from the debris uh, and then create a home that's more stable and can resist earthquakes. Um, so that is Nepal. I um, went to an artist residency up in the uh, village of Marfa uh, in the apple orchards and it was just marvelous. Um, and afterwards, I also went to Greece to research uh, on the topics of the refugee crisis that triggered in Syria uh, back in 2015, uh, where uh, the, uh, the mass conflict that was happening in the country was the driving people out of the country by the millions. Uh, this is no statistic, by, uh, about 3.1 million was driven out of the country at the time. And they were taking different routes to leave the country to try to get to Europe to find asylum. Um, so mostly I focused on um, the refugees uh, escaping through Turkey and to get into Greece. Uh, and I'm going to be focusing on the Lesbos Island and there and within the Red Arrow. The, the gap in the Red Arrow is about maybe 10 miles long. But when you have human traffickers overloading these uh, robber dinghies, the boats are gonna sink. Many boats have sunk, uh, sunk every single day. People have to swim for the shores if they can make it. Uh, but even if they make it, they have no guarantee that they're gonna be landing in a safe uh, landing zone. A lot of rocks are very sharp. Uh, there might be no roads to walk up to the uh, side of the road. Um, and if they land, they're landing around the top of the island and they have to make it down to the city of Mytilene, which is at the bottom right. And that's about a 15 mile hike uh, on the rough, uh, rough uh, mountainous roads. And People who come in, any volunteers, any tourists, they're not allowed to help these refugees because they can be arrested for human trafficking. Um, so the survivors typically have to find the shelter of their, on their own. They would basically have to uh, sleep anywhere they could find a space and, and see if they can get on. But first of all, they have to get registered for an asylum. But even if they register, it could take months, it could take a year before they can finally get on a boat to leave the island to go to the mainland. Um, again, a 2015 statistic, uh, 12 million people affected in the Syrian refugee crisis, which is more than the Haiti earthquake, Hurricane Katrina, and Indian Ocean tsunami combined. Um, and here are my images. I was visiting and um, volunteering in the village of, uh, um, uh, gosh, sorry, I'm starting to draw a blank at the moment. But it's at the northern part of the village. It's a fisherman's village. It's about a town of 300 folks. Um, and this is where the refugees first started landing. So uh, initially, the villagers were happy to help. They wanted to help uh, human beings and uh, people in need. Uh, they were providing food, they were providing world rescues, uh, but eventually the, the sheer amount of people coming in started uh, uh, creating uh, resentment towards the refugees. Um, uh, and as I was volunteering, I was uh, on the lookout uh, uh, duty, I was also uh, uh, helping refugees come on land. So I was on the landing party, but as soon as they land, we would make hot meals for them um, in these temporary uh, kitchen uh, situations. And so here are some of the Im images of uh, a boat landing. And as soon as they land, we've got to put on the emergency jackets against their skin, make sure they are warm and dry. Um, and one of the other things that I did was I went to a local camp, Pikba, where families were gathered. There's not too many families that are on the island together because all the refugees get just, just get shipped out on boats and they get separated for a long time. So those who are fortunate enough to uh, reunite and get sent to Camp Pikba, and I brought art supplies from Omaha, actually, and you know provided different uh, art activities. The refugees are not allowed to work. They're not allowed to go to school. They're not allowed to have any programming. Most of the time, they're just standing around with nothing to do. So they're more than happy 
to know that there were some kind of activities to do. Uh, all my art supplies were stolen within a couple of hours, but I was more than happy to provide for them. And they in turn made these fantastic artworks, which is also upstairs, uh, so if you're curious to see what they've drawn. And they're very wonderful, powerful stories. So when I was done, I um, started making my own reflection and uh, my own critique of how I was viewing the refugee crisis, which, which was initially through social media, which is why you see different uh, Instagram frames in this particular composition. Um, and then I also brought back a life jacket from the refugees uh, on the shores uh, myself. So this orange that's surrounding the frame is a life jacket that was worn by a refugee uh, to kind of tell that uh, story of that this is actually happening. Uh, this is still happening every day today. Um, and the triangular composition is meant to be an homage to the local arts scene with the Greek pediments and so on. And uh, this is a more like a local lore about uh, the Virgin Mermaid who helps satyrs cross the sea to safety. So I reimagined the Virgin as um, this uh, refugee woman who's helping fellow refugees cross to safety and uh, into Europe. Um, and this is another uh, story where uh, the refugees are landing, and this is kind of like an homage to uh, uh, the Venus piece where um, uh, the Venus was landing on shore, but I replaced the Venus with um, the mother and child, uh, the halo that's kind of making a uh, reference to the iconography, the icons in the local art scene. Uh, Vladimir Putin talking to Assad, which is causing the warfare in the background and the bombing. Um, so. My works reference contemporary times, contemporary history, and about humanitarian issues. Um, but shortly after I was done with the painting, I actually injured my arm, and I could not pick up a paintbrush for a while. It was hard for me to pick up a pencil. I could not pick up a glass of water. So I had to work find a different way to work. So I was experimenting with uh, laser cutting before, but not in the way that I was experimenting with this. I was separating uh, my pre-existing drawing or my painting and turning to digital drawing, and then I separate them, separated them into layers because somebody told me that, hey, your work looks like an altar. So uh, thinking of that, in fact, I started drawing and separating the layers digitally and then started reassembling back together using wood glue um, and then creating these small relief sculptures. Um, again, initially this was uh, using my old paintings, existing paintings as a reference, and I realized that this process was allowing me to make work a lot faster than I had with my paintings. My paintings would take anywhere between three months to a year, and these would take me a couple of days. So it was a much faster process, and then I started uh, sharing my process with um, other institutions wherever they would have me at their maker spaces. So I was able to access much larger equipment. Um, this is the largest piece I made, which is about four feet high by uh, three feet wide. Um, and then I started going to other university institutions uh, to collaborate and work with uh, their local students uh, to help build a composition together. Uh, so this is me and the other students, and that's at Ohio University, um, to uh, come up to finish this particular piece here. Um, and again, the builds were initially based on my existing compositions and paintings, but eventually it came to a point where I just started making my own uh, original digital compositions on the computer, uh, making references to the different refugee crisis, how refugees have to pay a lot of money to uh, cross the seas with safety, but yet they're still risking their lives. Um, and then as I started traveling around the country, I started collecting more local stories. Uh, this is about the protest of uh, the oil rig in uh, Alaska in, uh, over at Portland. And this is about the Yellowstone bison culling, which is um, uh, the fact that hundreds of bison are being uh, culled every year to control the population because the Montana ranchers don't want them coming to Montana uh, during the springtime. Um, and it's causing like almost a near extinction among the bisons. Um, this is about the piece. Uh, this is the piece about um, the time in Nepal that I was visiting, and about the earthquake, about the landslide that happened in the village of Langtang, uh, the earthquake that happened that's in the center uh, at the at the border of India, where they were trying to get some supplies in, like water, petroleum, but nothing was coming in because of the political upheaval that was happening between um, India and uh, Nepal at the time, um, and other things I saw around the country, like the. Um, the camp in uh, Wyoming where uh, the former Japanese uh, um, internment camp were. 
um, and then making uh, commentary about the past and how we view the past and sometimes not learn from the past and how the mistreatments of human beings in this uh, country, be it in the past or currently. Um, here's a piece about uh, how refugees uh, depend on cell phone as their lifeline. The first thing the refugees ask for when they land is, uh, can I charge my phone? So we set up a charging tent. So thinking of that fact, um, I made this composition uh, where the refugees is asking for help, which is why you have the ignore and answer on the top. Um, and so I'm always considering the different challenges and different issues, and again, contemporary times. This is about uh, our immigration uh, issues that was happening in um, Texas a few years ago, about a three-year-old girl that was in the court uh, on trial for her illegal immigrant uh, status when she didn't speak English, when she didn't know who or where she was or why she was there. Um, and then I went to New Orleans uh, to gather stories there about the lead poisoning, killing the children there. Uh, and to uh, commentary about the opioid crisis in uh, Oklahoma. Uh, and uh, yeah, I was making these newer paintings uh, combined with my laser relief because uh, I thought they brought more uh, layers of uh, meaning, and, but it was taking way too much time. So I hired a studio assistant by the name of Elisa Walcott, um, and she was one of our bright students at the University of Nebraska in Omaha. And uh, while she was never my student, uh, I tend to pick on her brain a lot. And I knew that at the time that she was coming back from Iraq for doing humanitarian work. And um, there were some perils in the way that we worked um, about our interest in connection with other people and human beings and the humanitarian issues. And I knew that she could paint very well. So I asked her to come help me with my works because painting takes a long time, as I mentioned. So one of the first um, pieces that she helped me work on was this piece about the, the earthquake. No, I'm sorry, not the earthquake. The, um, um, the, uh, the winter from a couple years ago when all the ice melted and then it just flooded uh, the state and affected the cattle and so on. Um, and then I made a piece about the Las Vegas shooting uh, back in uh, 2017. Um, and so with her help, I was able to make more colorful, more meaningful works, compositions such as this. And um, yeah, I'm pretty happy that it's going in this particular direction. So to conclude, uh, I just want to say a few things about being a practicing artist. Um, it's important that artists who create a digital archive of all their works, uh, have an art statement or CV, biography, and uh, so on ready. Uh, have an elevator speech in case they meet somebody to talk about their work, uh, to learn and write about their own works, uh, and how that's constantly evolving. Um, and that they should maintain a website, a social media page, um, have a press release ready for their works uh, in case they have a show. Uh, that they should always support uh, fellow artists uh, locally and then promote them uh, because whatever, provide, whatever help that they provide will come back to them as well. Um, it's important to establish works locally, regionally, and nationally through different artist calls, uh, save all the receipts uh, for the art-related expenses and for tax purposes. Um, it's important to have an art hero, uh, dead or alive, to look up to. Um, they got to learn to properly pack their artworks. Um, most important lesson is to not be a jerk. Nobody likes a jerk. Nobody wants to work with a jerk. Uh, have an attitude of gratitude and choose a topic of passion and follow through. Um, so my, in my conclusion, art making, it's still an egocentric act, as it is difficult, if not impossible, to remove the self. Um, but it can be a catalyst to serve the greater, larger picture and the greater good. It's a tool to, for introspection, self-awareness, and connection with other people. Art makers an opportunity to start a dialogue and conversation on things that are poignant in contemporary times and today's world. Um, so that is my slide, but I'm going to uh, hand this over to Elisa now because I want her to uh, share her works as well. Awesome, let's uh, put our hands together for James.